This is great. Okay, so I guess let's let's get started so we can leave some space if there's some comments or questions from the audience, there'll be some space to or just have a broader um, discussion amongst us. Um, so again, welcome, a formal welcome everyone, um, uh, Ferdinand and Onur in particular for, for being a part of the, the New Voices um, seminar series and for the audience members too for coming along and listening. Uh, my name is Amanda Chisholm and I am a senior lecturer across the School of Security studies, um, also organizer and chair of this um, seminar series. And the series itself is designed to um, amplify the voices and expertise of our early career researchers across the school and to showcase the diverse research um, uh, that, that our, our PhD and our early career researchers are doing. And so, you know, with that, I'm so excited to have Honor here and Ferdinand um, as a discussant. So Honor um, is a PhD student in the Department of War Studies and his research interests cover um, the development of coercive institutions, authoritarian rule, and Middle East uh, uh, and Middle Eastern politics more broadly. And most recently, he was the guest editor for Strife Journal 2021 joint issue um, with the Institute mm. of Middle Eastern Studies. So, Arnir, welcome. Um, oh, thank you. The title of Orner's presentation today is Surviving Democracy, Power Sharing and the Politics of Police Reform in Tunisia. So, as I said, Arnir is joined um, by uh, Ferdinand Eibel, who is his discussant. And Ferdinand is a senior uh, lecturer in political economy and the program director of the MA Politics and Economics of the Middle East. Uh, he completed his PhD in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. He also holds an MPhil in Modern Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Oxford and a BA in Political Science from the University. Oh my goodness, I don't think I can pronounce that Ferdinand. Can you pronounce that you you hold a BA in politics from the university? Yeah. So it's called Eichstätt, English, okay. and it's uh, and together with the French University, UPRN. So it was a dual degree, but never mind. It seems like half a century ago. Does it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it showcases, um, you know, the the diversity of, of your, um, you know, your at your expertise, but also mm. the specific focus on the Middle East. So, perfect discussant um, um, today, no doubt. No doubt there will be some vibrant conversation. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass the virtual floor over to you, owner, to share the screen. Uh, you have some slides to share, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and so the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just put up the slides and it should be working right now. Can you see them? Yeah. Yeah, it's oh, great. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for actually sharing your lunch time with me. Uh, just a bit of a caveat. I know I start when I signed up for this, I was a PhD student, actually ended up finishing my PhD while uh, writing this paper. So, but uh, I should have updated that, but uh, that's perfectly fine. So, I will actually get right into it. In the next 45 minutes or so, what I would like to do is I will just uh, give you present my research question and perhaps give a bit of a overview towards the case and I realize that many people might not be familiar with Tunisia, then I will present my theoretical framework and I will finish by presenting some empirical evidence from across the board and uh, talk a bit about what can we actually gather from this and what further work can be done from this project. So I first started doing this paper actually around 2019 when I realized that the police repression has been you know, slowly creeping back to Tunisia. And that was before the President uh, Kais Said's incumbent takeover in 2021. The problem with police reforms is, as we see in the literature, is that they fail very, very frequently. Many efforts uh, fail outright or they remain symbolic. In other cases, what happens is they become diluted into the reform attempts that end up not being much of an institutional change. Others, unfortunately, are rolled back after years of seeming success. And this is actually happens in many places. We have examples from Latin America and we have examples from South Africa. Some of them are treated as success stories, for example, and Tunisia was actually one of them until very recently for sometimes almost a decade or more, then we see those projects unfortunately failing, which is an interesting. And the problem is that happens at the background of democratization. 
you know, police reform is quite problematic everywhere, as we can probably see it recently. I mean, democracies are not immune to this problem, as we have seen in the United States last year, and also even in the United Kingdom this year, which has been what's going on with the Metropolitan Police. In the case of a democratic transition, however, this is a crucial problem. This is about the consolidation of the democracy. This is about the survival of the democracy and survival of usually what is a very brittle political transition. And the problem is, it seems that the relationship between democratization and police reform is not very consistent. So my question is the why authoritarian police forces manage to avoid reform so often, right? And I delve into this debate, if you like, by a single case study of Tunisia or the democratic Tunisia, if you like. And my method is process tracing. What I do is that I start from my independent variables, and which is the, uh, the case of Tunisian the case of Tunisian power sharing, and I trace it all the way to the failure of police reforms. So my case here, what we're talking about, is the case of what we can't call the democratic Tunisia. As many of you might have known, Tunisia was the first country to experience the so-called Arab Spring in 2010 and 2011. After they started their democratic transition in January 2000 and 2011, there is a period of 10 years until President Saeed's incumbent takeover in, uh, this, in the summer of 2021, which we can actually uh, analyze as a case of democratic transition. Uh, some people say that the transition has not ended to, as a failure. Some people say that it is still continuing, but I am going to cut my analysis in the year of 2021, just for the sake of brevity and also in order to avoid the moving target problem. And when we restrict our case like that, Tunisia is actually very interesting because when you take a look at the VDAM data, it is actually one of the two major cases of democratization in the last decade, the other one being Armenia. In a decade which was marked by democratic regression pretty much everywhere in the world, Tunisia stood out with a couple of outliers. And Tunisia also is quite interesting because it's a country as, whose internal security apparatus which is based on the Ministry of Interior, whose uh, photograph you can actually see in the uh, bottom right hand of the, the slide, uh, it was more dominant than its armed forces. So most of the research in Middle East and North Africa actually focuses on armed forces and militias, right? So the Tunisia is quite exceptional as we probably need to focus a bit more on its police forces and the internal security forces as opposed to its military. Although excellent work has been done on militaries quite recently, the, our understanding of policing, unfortunately, is uh, lagged behind. And finally, Tunisia is a case of pacted transition, trans transition which is, uh, provides a comparable case with the case of what happened in the uh, Eastern Europe in the 1990s or the Southern Europe in the 1980s, or you can also give some, draw some parallels with the Latin America in the previous two cases as well. So the case has some broader relevance in terms of thematic. So it reflects some challenges of democratic consolidation. And for the Arab world as well, it actually allows us to trace how state coercion actually you know, evolved in the Arab world in the decade after the uh, Arab Spring. And finally, and perhaps some most importantly for some of you, it is quite important from a policy perspective as well, because the, from the simple reason that we have very poor results relative to the timer funds allocated uh, to the police reform in Tunisia, which includes several million dollars from the EU, uh, a full-fledged pol community policing reform program from the United Nations, and at least you know funding coming from six other nations, just constantly uh, uh, spent in ten years to very little effect. As I said, uh, the extant literature actually gives us already a couple of explanations. So, one good thing if you like with the Arab Spring is that uh, the post-2011 security sector reform researchers, many of them are actually led by NGOs and international organizations. They received an unprecedented access, especially until 2013. This line of research has actually provided us uh, a line of uh, empirical information, which was unprecedented and previously not available. And they actually pointed towards some of the key variables I'm talking about today, such as the political polarization or the structure of the internal security apparatus. But the problem with that of the search, if you like, is that it has very strong normative underpinnings. It tends to equate lack of reform with failure 
and it tends to undercount institutional change, which is not necessarily democratic. What I mean by that is that those authoritarian police forces, in order to survive, they actually change quite a lot inside the transition. They innovate, they form new partnerships. And this line of research, as because this line of uh, innovation is usually not very democratic, sometimes undercounts it or tends to uh, you know, uh, disregard it because they are looking for signs of democratization. This is perfectly fine from their own perspective, but from an academic perspective, you need to be you know, more considered. That being said, the single most powerful explanation in uh, Tunisian security reform right now is the perceived trade-off between the security sector reform and the counterterrorism. Some of you might know that the, Tunisia has been fighting uh, counterinsurgency and in the several waves of terrorist attacks, which started actually quite soon into its political transition. And especially around 2015, after the beach attack in Suez and a couple of high profile attacks, counterterrorism in Tunisia became a major issue and started attracting an incredible amount of attention from the Western security services as well. Uh, there are a couple of papers here. I think the Rutano Santini's work is the best example of this. And you can also check the Nicolotito's paper on the perceived trade-offs and how uh, political elites actually present this security versus other reforms trade-off to the public to you know, reduce the pressure they have on security reform. We also have a couple of uh, other explanations, such as Mosef Kartaj's work on bureaucratic resilience and Audrey Poulter's work on the, in the failure of individual reforms. Those uh, line of literature usually emphasizes the, the failure of individual reforms and they, and they emphasize the resilience of the bureaucratic apparatus in the face of reform. But there are a couple of weaknesses with this line of inquiry, if you like. The first is the question of timing. It is true that the shift, uh, it is true that the shift of counterterrorism actually made a major impact on Tunisian course of apparatus. However, as I argue in the next few minutes, the shift actually started happening long before the security threats presented themselves. Secondly, even after the counterterrorism threat started to subside after 2018, we did not see a return to reform. So I think this explanation on counterterrorism actually or threats actually cannot explain and everything. Secondly, there is the issue of causality. It is true that there is empirical research citing that the, you know, an active insurgency or active security threats are likely to reduce the probability of reform, but the causal relations between them are quite undetermined. For example, we have a couple of opposing cases. Take Ukraine, for example. They were able to enact a police reform while dealing with very similar issues. And despite the fact that they received, they perceived a very clear threat from Russia, which is currently being materialized, they were able to run a successful program. Now here actually brings the question of my own explanation, if you like. This is, a, this is an explanation actually based on the institutional literature and it's an explanation based on path dependency. What I argue essentially is that coercive institutions, the police and military in general, they are exceptionally path dependent institutions, right? They are very difficult to form because of the initial investment that is required and the specialist training is required and the money required. And they are also exceptionally, perhaps even harder to abolish. They can be even more dangerous. The problem is when you try to abolish them, those forces are very likely to show very serious resistance to reform, which can take several extra legal measures, which can happen in the form of coup attempts or the clone of disobeying orders or in the form of many other forms of resistance they can actually put off. And it can be even more dangerous. There are several other cases in the literature where you know, any attempt to establish reform or any attempt to establish some of those course of institutions actually calls with significant amount of violence. So for many governments, actually, the default option is to not to do any reform at all. It's an accommodation. Taking this into account, most of the literature on police reform actually say that you need an external shock for this reform. This is, in many cases, a violent encounter between the state and the security forces, oh, pardon, sorry, uh, between the citizens and the security forces. Literature on Russia, for example, says that in the Marat's work, you need a transformative violence 
between the state and the citizens. Or in the Gonzalez work, you need a crisis, right? A high profile crisis, which will actually change the opinion of a uh, median voter. So the politicians will be actually compelled to undertake, you know, reforms that are otherwise too risky or quite simply, you know, way too you know, expensive to implement. That being said, a political transition such as what Tunisia experienced is, should be the perfect opportunity for that, right? Uh, they had this opportunity due to the regime change. They had the opportunity to break the pot dependencies. And they also had a significant amount of uh, reasons to make reform because of the violence inherent in the Arab Spring as well. We sometimes tend to think Tunisian uprising as a peaceful event, but this was actually not the case. There has been a significant amount of casualties, and people thought that the, the police was using snipers or mercenaries. And in general, the security sector reform was actually one of the highest items in the agenda in the immediate aftermath of the uprisings. And think this, even in the case of, of uh, no real uh, demand from the public, in a political transition, the incoming elite needs to reform themselves. In many cases, uh, a political transition means that you have people that are previously subjects of state repression, which is the case of Islamists and the Ennahda party in Tunisia, that now became part of the formal politics. And those people need to reach a form of accommodation with a security force which has been tasked with repressing them until very, very recently, actually. And you can extend this argument to the other forces as well. Yet, there are quite a bit of aspects to actually prevent reform, right? The first things first, you know, political transitions are inherently uncertain. Uh, rules are not set in peace. Nobody really knows what's going to happen in 10 years and people seek guarantees and deals, right? And this is further exacerbated by the fact that, I think this is from the uh, Grants uh, Right and Fitness 2010 database, the failure rate of political transitions around 50%. Half of political transitions actually do not end up being a democracy. They either get stuck in some form of hybrid regime or they simply transition to another authoritarian regime, which is my Tunisia might be experiencing right now, actually, to the period of 10 years. But in period, it is actually very, very problematic, especially when you combine it with the inherent resistance from the security institutions. So this brings us to the question of first, how we can observe the reform? And how we can actually, how this, how this you know, uh, new democracies can actually neck, neck reform. The observation is rather straightforward. In my PhD research and the, and the next research, my, the best method I found is to take a look at the staffing decisions, right? Who gets hired? Who gets fired? And under what circumstances people get promoted? You can trace it at the entry level and you can trace it at more senior levels of the security bureaucracy, right? If you check other similar cases, such as what happened in Ukraine, in Georgia, and also partially Brazil as well, almost every single instance of successful reform requires a very high amount of staff turnover. And this was the case in the Eastern Europe as well, such as the illustration hellos they had in the end of 1990s. They required vetting, they required an incredible amount of staff turnover, which is a very laborious process, but to a large extent, at least it has been successful and that's a common team in all of them. And the second one is the organizational structure, which is inherently about which organizations uh, answer to which ones and how the organizational charts has changed over time. I believe that using a combination of two, we can actually trace reform, which is something not very easily traceable because everyone has an incentive in saying that, yes, we did reform, uh, but to, in order to understand it in a more natural way, if you like, I found that these two variables usually work the best. And to understand how an incoming government can actually push for reform in the face of these odds, I present this very simple model, if you like. In an ideal scenario, what happens is you will get a programmatic police reform. There is a reform program, there are white papers, you know, everything happens through a specific and given process, right? It is a top-down reform usually, but it it needs to include the public input as well, but it more or less forms a coherent program. That often requires a unified government or a single actor, which is actually able to overcome institutional inertia. You can think of the African National Congress in South Africa or the Solidarity in Poland. In those cases, there was at least one group 
within the transition, which was actually the monopoly, a significant amount of power, which allowed them to get significant amount of standing and political power, which allowed this uh, political actors or the new coming elites, if you like, to overcome significant amount of that resistance. The problem is, empirically, those cases are a minority. In the vast majority of transitions, those revolutionary coalitions, if you like, often break down and polarization rather than unity is known. And there are a line of research from Sebelis's work saying that the polarized governments and, and the fractured governments are uh, more likely, are less likely to enact more dangerous reforms because they usually do not have the same amount of reform capacity. This is because you are introducing new veto actors and they are not like, they're unlikely to have, uh, they're unlikely to uh, be able to get enough power or the elder in domestic breaking within the coalition will simply prevent it. In a worst case scenario, what should happen is you might get these people together in the form of a top power sharing or coalition agreement, but they, they cartelize as in Slutter's work and they establish a party cartel which is more or less independent from the public fields. And in the end, what happens is that they actually have very little incentive to push for any reform. Yet, this is not to say that it is all doom and gloom for coalition and power sharing government, because in one's paper, for example, say that power sharing governments can still enact reform, especially if you can do side payments and actors have sufficient guarantees uh, that will uh, allow them to you know, keep their position in the future. And what I briefly argue is that in Tunisia, party cartelization happened. And they were able to do the side payment payments to make sure that all actors receive a form of compensation. However, this lighter fact on sufficient guarantees was never achieved. And this has caused the reforms to ultimately fail. This actually brings us to the case of the democratic transition in Tunisia, right? So the policing is probably one of the defining characteristics of Tunisia under Ben Ali, right? The, there is a very limited amount of literature specializing on the interior ministry of, of under Ben Ali's Tunisia, and it usually defines as a black box, if you like, which is run by competing cartels. Uh, mapping those cartels specifically has been impossible so far, yet we know that they are quite unstable. And we know that at the level of directors impact, uh, they actually you know, were able to control their uh, own networks, if you like competing networks specifically. And the policing has been quite authoritarian and quite obsessed with the regime security to the extent that it is low policing functions such as investigative powers has been quite low as the regime overwhelmingly diverted its sources to a specific kind of policing, right? And both high and low policing functions, but by high policing, I mean the intelligence and internal security functions. And by low policing, I mean the regular uh, investigative functions and the public order functions were actually done under the same body, right? Against that background, the Arab Spring made it very clear that this structure needed to be reformed, right? The spring itself, so the initial mobilization in December 2010 actually happened in the background of uh, police abuse. It happened in City Buzayt. And the protests partially became widespread because the police violence actually agitated citizens even further. So in the end of the day, what happened is that you have an inter internal interior ministry, which felt defeated to a large extent. And they was unable to actually protect itself against any form of uh, any form of reform attempts. There's actually a significant amount of evidence checking that uh, there are reports of police stations that are being burned after the uprising. Several of the officers actually refused to go on patrols because they believe that they will be insulted. Attacks against police officers were common. And there is actually even one figure as officials believe that the policing effectiveness around uh, one year after the revolution is actually around 30%. And that problem continued, especially in the less developed regions in the Tunisia, because the government was not able to restore this uh, efficiency, uh, policing efficiency, and that actually become a prolonged problem in the region. Against that background, the transitional governments were actually able to push for some reforms, right? And they actually deserve some mention here. Uh, 
first thing first, the first interim minister, uh, Farah Raji, was able to dismiss like 42 high ranking officials, including the entire general staff of the Director General of National Security, which is the highest commissioner body in Tunisia. Uh, and they were able to actually abolish a couple of departments, uh, including the Directorate of State Security. Now, that couple of waves of purges was influential because, you know, uh, it caused some of the people that are most associated with the Ben Ali regime to be changed. And perhaps more importantly, it actually allowed the incoming elite to claim that the so-called political police in Tunisia was no more and the surveillance of political opposition no longer existed in Tunisia. However, this was this approach, if you like, run into very serious political obstacles very soon. The first is the fact that none of this none of these initial moves were made in the framework of uh, uh, framework of uh, either uh, repair legislation or a coherent transitional justice framework. They are done actually under the state of emergency. As a result, some of those purges were actually ephemeral. The Farhat Raji, the first minister, actually lost his office in a matter of weeks because you know he actually ran into the opposition with local networks. And his predecessor actually revoked some of those purges. And even years after, some of the higher ranking officials that were purged, they were able to you know, get their red sentences reduced or quite simply get decisions revoked because they won another case in the administrative court because they said that this you know, state of emergency decisions were not valid and they actually violated their employment rights in Tunisia. As a result, what happened is that after starting from 2016, we see a return of some of these officers in the form of advisory posts. And furthermore, what happened is this, we suddenly saw that the political will for maximalist security reform has disappeared. And this was not always the case. And not that the biggest party after the revolution and Islam, so-called Islamist party, uh, they actually pushed for a much more comprehensive re reform and illustration law for a while. But after seeing the dangers of such a law in terms of political polarization, they actually took a step back. And similar uh, events also happened. There was a comprehensive white paper for policy reform published in 2011. But this time when Nata came to power due to political considerations, they ended up rejecting that as well. So it became clearly very close to, it became very clear that the political will was missing. Even by the start of 2013, when we interviewed politicians, it became clear that everyone was saying that any reform would have to wait for the next elections or the, even the writing of the constitution. So not much would happen at that stage, which was actually a very good opportunity. And that brings us to the issue of consensus and uh, power sharing in Tunisia, which is the main reason why that happened. The issue is that the Tunisian transition actually took power sharing qualities almost immediately after Ben Ali's departure, right? Uh, the Yat Penashur Commission, which kind of set the rules of the transition, made it clear that you know, the Tunisia would go through in the context of proportional vote representation in the elections. They formed commissions and they tried to give guarantees to as many groups as possible. The proportional vote in particular was crucial because in the absence of a political party, which can actually gain a very clear majority, that pretty much guaranteed that a coalition government would actually rule Tunisia. And this process actually continued afterwards. When a set of crises actually hit Tunisia in 2013, the ultimate resolution was to establish a National Reconciliation Commission in 2013, which actually granted Anatta and its biggest competitor, Nida Tunis, informal veto rights over key policies. And this agreement was further, if you like, consolidated in the Carthage Arrangement of 2016, which established a national salvation government in Tunisia. So what we see is that wherever there is a political crisis in Tunisia, the number one solution was to you know, fall back to what they call as a consensus governance, which increasingly took the ingredients of a power sharing deal. And this is actually not bad. Truth is, the power sharing deal probably saved Tunisian democracy in a couple of key episodes in 2013, just after the coup in Egypt, as there were similar calls in Tunisia. 
and it actually generated a degree of stability in the country, which was lauded. Alfred Stepan, you know, uh, famous wrote an article about you know, just even uh, tolerations, which lauded this so-called deal between Islamists and secularists. Which, and claiming that you know this was uh, something unique to Tunisia for that time being because you know that deal simply failed in other cases, most notably in Egypt. And people also say that this uh, kind of model, if you like, which be expanded to other countries, which actually you know uh, got the, a couple of key NGOs a Nobel Peace Prize in the end. But the problem is, in other aspects, this has been extremely problematic. The number one problem here is the fact that it creates rotten compromise uh, and, and this transition, those are actually uh, taken from other words, uh, which is just like more critical of the transition. And that did not actually create enough uh, social economic reforms, which allowed the country to go ahead, right? And what I would like to do right now is that to form some connections uh, between those uh, political reforms and specific decisions that are made within the security bureaucracy. There you go. So the number one problem with this power sharing agreement is the, which is the staffing decisions. As I said before, we can actually analyze it in two ways. One is the recruitment at the lower levels. So as Tunisian security apparatus started recruiting new members to the security force, what happened is that the issue become immediately extremely politicized. Uh, media started making publications stating that Islamists are actually trying to infiltrate, if you like, the security apparatus. And uh, Islamist actors, in the other hand, started saying that the security apparatus were inherently against them. And, you know, they're actually actively working against them, which might be correct, actually, to a large extent. And that kind of debate, unfortunately, became even more uh, acrimonious over time as the opposition claimed that Ennahda had a parallel security apparatus inside the interior ministry. And there was a dark room in the interior ministry, which, you know, actually conspired with Ennahda against uh, their own, uh, against their political opposition. The result is what happened is the hyper politicization of security governance, right? Decision making become extremely complicated. And this continued even after the passing of the constitution. Uh, because of the consensus, they were not able to agree on much many, many rules with sensitive security reforms. So a lot of issues were actually led to customary, uh, customary practice. As a result, in the next five years or so, what happened is that there was a constant bickering between the prime ministry, the presidency, and opposition parties. And they have been uh, trying to overreach, overreach and you know, step over their mandate often breaching their constitution. And we have seen moves from the presidency and we have also seen moves from the prime ministry and others as well. But the result in general was a significant amount of stability in security bureaucracy, right? It is possible actually to, to, to you know, take a look at this from the higher levels of security bureaucracy as well. The problem is Tunisia had 10 interior ministers in 10 years and Due to the very acrimonious, you know, nature of this uh, security, the, the, the very acrimonious nature uh, of the uh, staffing process, they found a solution in recruiting people from the previous generation, actually. So around 50% of highest level directors in the Tunisian security bureaucracy, and especially in the level of the general director of national security, are actually officers that are recalled from retirement. retirement. And these networks are very unstable. Because of the political competition, they usually last in their office in just over a year, which is much, much shorter when compared to the average tenure of a security officer under Ben Ali. And the problem is, it um, became obvious that those networks are actually being well influenced by other actors beyond their constitutional mandate. Some people claim that the specific director is close to the president. Others claim that the specific director is actually close to the Islamist party. And in the overall, sometimes because those coalition actors cannot decide on a good candidate, positions were left vacant, or the only thing they could do was to, you know, just agree on a rather weak candidate that would be a placeholder. And it was not possible to push for reforms in that uh, specific environment. There was even in one case, actually, one security officer got so annoyed by the process that they actually called the promotion process a rooster fight, which has been going for several years and made you know, any proper reform project impossible. 
And this is very bad from a perspective of project management as well, because first, nepotism means that outgoing directors all usually bring their stuff with them and their connections because they do not want a director coming from another uh, support network, if you like, to inherit what they have. And secondly, the share rotation of directors meant that the funding for security sector reform projects usually overlasted their main connection in the uh, in the in the, pri in the ministry, which means that you got the reform uh, and you started working with the ministry, but you usually ended up working for two, perhaps three different directors, which is actually very not conductive to reform. And the second major issue is the protester protester movement being heavily marginalized. The problem here with the Arab Spring is that it actually never ended, right? So protest numbers in Tunisia after 2010 remained remarkably higher when considered to the authoritarian era. From a perspective of democratization, this is perfectly fine and even accepted. The problem is this was a significant challenge for the police force as it, it does a permanent shift in state society relations, and they did not know how to deal with that. And the reason, and, and, the, and the main, and as a result, what happened is that that actually caused significant amount of protester violence, and it caused a couple of events that actually should have caused uh, police reform as they are scandals in the traditional sense. As you can see that by 2018, the reform towards the police force in Tunisia was actually as low as 26%. This is actually comparable to the Latin American levels just before they started their reform. However, the scandals, as we see, they did not evolve into reform. And this is because party cartelization in Tunisia meant that in order for this you know, coalition between seculars and the so-called seculars and the so-called Islamists to survive, it had to be detached from all uh, ideological and usually the social demands coming from their basis. So they had a very strong incentive in both parties to suppress dissent from the population which caused both secular and Islamist actors to, you know, apply, uh, you know, split for calm and even support security forces in the face of clear protester violence. In this environment, any form of reform was pretty much impossible. And the final point I would like to make here is that the bureaucratic resistance, right? This uh, party controlization over time meant that the trust in democratic process in Tunisia was decreased significantly over time. And this has been a problem going for a long time, actually. But the problem is, in every single uh, uh, survey poll, especially after 2013, Tunisian security bureaucracy, despite everything that's been going on, ranks consistently higher than the trust in elected bodies, which allowed this police unions, which emerged after 2011, to become much more stronger. What happened is the police officers themselves, motivated by the trauma of the revolution and the necessity to protect their own interests, started unionizing and took a page from the protester handbook. There's a couple of examples in the slide that are actually protests by the security forces themselves. And they very soon established themselves as some sort of low level, level veto actors. The problem is for these actors, those piecemeal reforms available in the absence of a programmatic reform is actually quite easy to defend. Sometimes they could actually content promotion decisions. In other cases, they actually enacted extra legal resistance. For example, they refused to deploy. In a few cases, they actually used violence against protesters. In a couple of cases, they directly threatened their superiors. And what happened is the only way to prevent these reforms for the elites was actually to threaten them with the military court which did not always work. And by 2018, they pushed us far as trying to legislate impunity using a couple of, uh, if you like, very aggressive legislation. And they were actually able to establish themselves as uh, key partners. And that brings us to the conclusion. So I quite simply argue that the consensus might have saved Tunisian democracy for at least 10 years, but it has actually killed the reform. That bureaucracy and police force today enjoys a level of autonomy and political maneuvering, which was simply unthinkable under Ben Ali. And they are actually much stronger in some aspects when, uh, when compared to what was available under Ben Ali's rule, which actually for should force us to think of what we mean by the security force assistance and what are the actual consequences of some of the security aids this country has been receiving. And I also argue that you know, these institutions, they are not mere authoritarian leg legacies, 
police forces in order to adapt themselves to the new uh, institutions, they can actually innovate quite a lot. And the importance of the, what the actual decisions make the, uh, during the transition era politics is actually more important. So we probably need a more actor-based approach to understand these uh, processes. And I do realize that the incremental institutional change still occurs. So some of the things I'll say might be invalidated in the next 10 years or so, because this is what happened in Latin America. Uh, police reform seems to be stagnant for 30 years until it suddenly starts, which will be hopefully the case. And uh, finally, the next steps for this research would be the wider dissemination, including publishing actually this paper and fixing the missing data problems coming from the the COVID measures. And what I would like to do in the future is to you know, extend this research agenda even further so it will actually become a comparative study, perhaps beyond the MENA region, preferably uh, taking a look at comparable cases uh, of political uh, transition. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. The draft paper is going to be available in my website and on my Twitter as well, actually, probably next week. Uh, I just need to fix a couple of things with the data and so on. So uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Kara. Sorry, I didn't realize you had um, finished your, your PhD. That's fabulous. And what a fantastic presentation, very detailed. Um, so I guess we'll pass the floor over to, to Ferdinand at this stage, if Ferdinand has, you know, for any um, commentary. And again, for the audience members, um, please do raise your hand if you'd ask, uh, like to ask a question live or just um, type it in the Q&A chat box. So Ferdinand, I'll pass the floor over to you. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, and thank you, Honor. Um, this is an absolutely fascinating paper. Um, as somebody who studies Tunisia, I still, you know, learned a lot from the paper because police reforms are not necessarily something that people, uh, especially during a transition context, uh, you know, pay a lot of attention to. But it's absolutely vital, especially now in a, a context where authoritarian backsliding is likely to kind of put the security apparatus back on our research agenda. Um, you know, it, it, it is also with you, I, I agree with your fundamental argument and that the, the Tunisian consensus um, may have saved democracy or the transition uh, in 2013, but had so many negative knock-on effects and ultimately may not have even saved democracy because if you think about the one of the effects of this consensus um, driven transition was that they couldn't nominate a constitutional court, which would have been exactly the institution that could have held Kaysay uh, back in his in his, his attempt to kind of uh, un undo uh, Tunisian democracy. So there's a certain tragedy in there. And looking back, I, I was in Tunisia in 2013. There was a lot of polarization that there was indeed a danger of this process really going pear shaped. But it is it is hard to pinpoint a moment where you where it would have been easy to kind of untangle this consensus driven politics again uh, there was a certain kind of uh, dynamic uh, also in the sense that both major political actors benefited from this okay so this this much about sort of the the, the broader argument let me go uh, into the details a little bit i've got so two types of comments on, on the paper slash uh, presentation. One a set of comments um, relating to questions of research design, how you how you um, you know package your material, how you're trying to turn this into sort of a paper that would uh, um, you know come uh, come out in a very very good political science journal, and then some more kind of uh, empirical questions related to. Uh, the case study that you present. So in terms of the research design, I think from my point of view, I would like the comparative uh, aspect to be actually quite more explicit. You do this very often implicitly. There's Latin America in the background. There is Eastern uh, um, uh, Europe in the background. But I think you could actually go all the way and make this sort of a, a, a paired comparison, or at least have a very strong shadow case study that kind of shapes our expectations and allows the reader to somewhat gauge the, 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 the processes that have been going on in Tunisia in light of, in light of other cases. I think analytically that that would be um, 
very helpful and maybe you know contrast Tunisia with a case of successful reform may, may, may provide you know a good uh, you know backdrop here. I was also not sure whether you would think Tunisia is actually a least likely case for this type of reform to succeed or a most likely case which sort of from a comparative politics um, research design point of view is important you know least likely case because of the deter deteriorating security situation, terrorism and all of this. But then again, in your presentation, you made the point very strongly that the transition itself actually in a, opened a window of opportunity and could have turned Tunisia sort of into a most likely case of success. So I think if you guide the reader's expectations at the um, beginning of your paper a little bit better in terms of how likely was this ever going to succeed given the structural conditions in which this transition unfolded? I think uh, that, that would have been helpful. Um, in, the, in the presentation, uh, you, you highlight the kind of key variable much more in the paper. There is, you, you actually have a number of factors that are sort of highlighted as potential causes. And, and I found this somewhat, um, you know, confusing. So I think it's important that you kind of hone in on one or two, you know, really determining factors. And I think there again, the comparative aspect could help you because it may, may uh, uh, you know, uh, highlight the importance of some causal variables more than others. And sort of from a process tracing point of view, I wasn't quite sure whether this is theory generating process tracing or theory testing process tracing. Um, if it's theory testing process tracing, then the theoretical expectations need to be front loaded much more and made much, much stronger, because then you, you have a framework either developed by other people or by yourself, and then you, you go on and test about it. And I want to know, I would want to know as a reader, what type of evidence would, would challenge your theoretical framework or in fact corroborate it. Uh, if there's a theory developing one, then um, I would expect more sort of, I would expect some section towards the end where you pull it all together in some sort of a framework, analytical framework that could be applied to some, some other case study. So at the moment you, you don't do either. And I, I wasn't quite sure what type of process tracing you're actually engaging in. And I think once you've made this decision, you can actually streamline the paper according. Secondly, I think that's more sort of a meta question, but. It, 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 I think it is important for your overall theoretical argument. The agency structure question struck me as something that's quite important here on several levels. Well, first of all, um, a lot of your argument seems to be about replacing old agents with new agents, right? And then you, you, you highlight that this is how Eastern European countries did it. Um, and I, I don't know the literature well enough. I can't, you know, gauge what extent this was really the determining factor in reforming their, their, their police. It seems to me that this has to be part of the package of, of measures that one adopts. But I was wondering to what extent sort of the structures of accountability and in this context also judicial reforms play an equally important role in reforming and reforming the police force. I mean, one is obviously, you know, get, get rid of the uh, torturers, get rid of the, the most, uh, you know, uh, of the worst people in the security apparatus. But then the other thing is, if, if there is no, if the judicial system doesn't have any control over the police force, if citizens can't take a police officer to the court for abuse of power, for, for torture, for, for, for uh, things like that, um, even a newly recruited police officer may, may very easily be socialized into a culture of, you know, um, not lawlessness, but impunity. Um, that, that would be the word. So, and in a way, you don't, you don't touch upon the parallel attempts in Tunisia to, uh, to uh, reform the judicial system at all. But I think, I think, it, is, uh, I think it is important to discuss this in, in this context. Um, um, yeah, and so now moving more to sort of the things related specifically to the case study, I think the you highlight a few key reforms, but there is a lot going on in the paper. So I would quite like to know as a reader, what were the kind of crucial moments? What were the critical moments where reform could have happened in this in these in this decade and didn't? Was it the white paper that was that was kind of watered down? So when were within this kind of critical junctures, mini critical junctures? I'd like to have a better map. Um, you know, you you also 
your argument, and I think you highlight this in the paper, uh, goes against some of the stuff that's been written about trust uh, amongst opposition actors in Tunisia. You know, Nugent's argument is very much that, you know, because they all faced repression, uh, secular actors and Islamist actors, there was increased trust and that enabled them to, uh, you, know, um, you know, carry out this transition process till the end, whereas in Egypt, because there was so, so much distrust between secularists and Islamists, um, actually the transition stalled. So I think you, you have to position yourself a little bit in, in this debate and whether you think there is actually a lot of trust or, or not, and to what extent then Nugent and others who've kind of made this point are, 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 are wrong. Um, training of police officers is again something that doesn't seem to come into play. It, it's about you know hiring, but uh, has a, has the training actually changed? Has you know our police academies you know operating differently in the post transition context? If not, then that's very easy to kind of just uh, you know. Um, to describe in a, in a paragraph as something that was not touched upon, but this in and of itself is actually interesting, right? If you recruit north of 20,000 uh, police officers into, into your security apparatus in a transition context, you would want to ensure that they get some sort of training in what it is to be a police officer in a democratic context. Now, the paper doesn't really tell me whether this happened or not, or whether this was kind of watered down. Um, so I would like to see a bit more on that. The the other kind of big omission, and that goes back to agency in, in the paper, uh, at the moment for me is international actors. And uh, this is kind of surprising because you highlight them in your presentation at the beginning as what as sort of, um, you know, being quite important in this context, both in terms of having leverage because they provided money, and you talk about a fully fledged UN, UN program to reform, but then the actual kind of argument that you build they are entirely peripheral. And it may well be that they, they were entirely peripheral, but it's still a bit puzzling that those who kind of provide the money have kind of zero leverage over the process. So in and of itself, the it would be interesting how kind of actors within the Ministry of Interior kind of blunted the potential influence that external actors could have had on, on, on reforms, right? So you can integrate them into your, into your uh, framework. And then, yeah, let me uh, highlight two things before I conclude. Well, the first thing is that higher trust in uh, police and military as opposed to elected institutions. I have heard this a lot over the last decade, and specifically with regard to the Middle East. And I would just like to know whether this is actually a Middle Eastern thing or whether this is a global phenomenon that actually may even happen in established and very consolidated democracies. If that's the case, then maybe we shouldn't make such a big deal about this because it, it may just be a background variable that, that, that happens anyway because people, for some reason, mistrust elected um, you know, officials more than unelected officials. So I think it, it, it's important that, you, that we kind of look at these uh, figures in, in comparative uh, in comparative uh, perspectives, and also these figures contradict to some extent what you said about um, the contradict the opinion polls that you presented about trust in the performance of the police, which wasn't very high. So I was a bit I was a bit confused about this. Um, and actually, in the interest of time, let me let me uh, stop here so that Honor has some some uh, opportunity to respond to this. But all of this uh, uh, um, shouldn't uh, you know. Um, I still want to underline the fact that this is a very strong paper, and I think it has the potential to really be published in a very good journal. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, I will actually try to answer the questions or the comments in the reverse order of, I've been taking notes. About the trust, trust issue, you might well be right. I, I probably need to check it, and maybe that might have to be removed. And uh, about the inconsistency in the data about trust, I actually, uh, that puzzled me quite a bit because I realized that the Arab parameter data and the independent survey data in Tunisia do not fit each other. Uh, and I actually asked a couple of questions. Uh, they don't know it. They don't know either why. Everyone is sure that their data is the best, of course. But yeah, you're right. Maybe there is an inconsistency problem there. That part should be reversed. About the international actors, you're right. Uh, I actually was trying to make it into a separate paper, but maybe that needs to be incorporated a bit more, especially given the. The UNDP is the committing policy program at least needs to be you know, analyzed a bit more uh, in 
detailed uh, about Elizabeth Nugent's paper and the issue of the level of trust between actors. I was actually thinking about her work a lot when I was writing this. And I, yeah, I think they are wrong. That and ultimately it's been proving wrong. And yeah, I will edit this section of the paper to you know underline the fact that you know the, the trust was perhaps better than Egypt, but still nowhere as the nowhere at the level where there actually needs to be. Like it is actually like a middle ground solution. It's still better than Egypt, but no, it's still, I mean, it's not, it simply was not enough. At least this is what I can say. And and uh, about the case, say, the the kind of case, I would actually say that yes, the Tunisia is a most likely case scenario, in, in, especially between the period of 2011 to 2013, it definitely is a most likely case scenario. And I will uh, do it a bit more uh, further, but uh, finally, one uh, thing interesting about the, you know the uh, the issue of comparative politics, you know, versus uh, the RS to this paper. That was actually a problem I had a lot because I wasn't sure where to submit this paper. So, if you are going to submit this to like a general political science journal, you're right, like it needs to be like a more theory testing paper. I actually started this as a paper which will go for uh, RS to this journal. And I realized the comparative element is quite strong. And uh, you're right, I think uh, a, harsh decision, a harsh decision has to be made there very soon. <laughs> and I will uh, aim to do that within this month. Thank you very much. I mean, given uh, the detail and richness, you know, you might even think about a book. Um, is there enough detail there or enough um, um, empirics there to make a book? Um, uh, that would be great. Only issue is that, as I the, the briefly mentioned, there is a, a data problem due to COVID. So confirmation, actually, what I have in my own uh, database, if you like, is a bit more detailed. But there are a lot of gaps, and some of them can't be filled without further field work. Mm. So uh, maybe a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> Always a postdoc, right? Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I can't wait to see where it does end up landing um, in, in print eventually. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. So, ah, um, uh, no time for to broader audience questions. But, um, you know, um, Anur and Ferdinand, I want to thank you so much for you know, uh, such a detailed and rich um, uh, presentation. And Ferdinand, your enthusiastic comments, I think, also indicate how excited you were um, ab about the paper as well, too. So um, thank you both for your engagement and being part of the seminar series. And yeah, Anur, keep us posted what, what happens with, um, with the paper. So um, to the audience, thank you for listening in. And I want to wish everyone a great afternoon. So and watch the space, it'll be circulated through social media, the, the recording as well, too. So thank you again, and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.